when plastic kit models hit their stride in the late 50s and early 60s, there were three main companies that held the greatest market share, Aurora, Monogram, and Revell. These three companies could not have had more different personalities, despite having all been basically garage or basement startups in the mid 40s and early 50s. Aurora was a New York company with a fly-by-the-seat-of-your-pants feel to it. They focused on three things, keeping costs down and prices low, having a wide selection, and perhaps most of all, getting to market first, even if it meant sacrificing accuracy. Their idea of market research was, hey, that's cool, let's make it. And they were usually right. Monogram was the polar opposite of Aurora. The Illinois-based company focused on making the best, most accurate models and had no interest in being the biggest, only the best, and they were not afraid to be a little more expensive. Ravel sat squarely between the others with a focus on both quantity and quality. Its founder had a burning desire for the Venice, California-based company to be the biggest model company out there, but to do so with a good quality product. Only Aurora and Ravel really pushed hard into the international markets. But in the end, even that could not save them from a fickle market in a changing world. Let's take a look at all three, beginning with Aurora. Abe Shikes and Joe Giammarino started Aurora in a garage in a workshop in Brooklyn in 1950, making plastic items for other companies. Henry Kolodkin was their injection molding expert. In 1952, Joe Cuomo joined Aurora. This was the first year they made their own products, toy bows and arrows, under their own name. It was about this time that Raymond Haynes of HMS Associates approached them with an idea. He had two model airplane kits made by the company Hawk, a Lockheed F-90 and a Grumman Panther Jet. Haynes, who loved aviation, suggested they make plastic kit model planes. Abe Shikes ran the numbers and liked the idea. As a major shortcut, they simply copied the Hawk models with only a scant few changes. Even the box and instructions were mostly copied, but they did include a tube of somewhat hard to obtain plastic styrene glue as a bonus. They would be confronted about this by the folks from Hawk at the next hobby industry convention, but Hawk accepted that it was just business. However, they did take precautions to ensure that future kits could not be copied. For better or worse, Aurora was in the plastic kit model business. In 1953, they added to their line a series of 148 scale model planes molded in bright colors. George Burt was hired to print up the box art, which was sent to Acme Box Company in Philadelphia for gluing to the boxes. Those completed boxes were then sent to Aurora in Brooklyn to have the kits and instructions put in them and load it up for shipping to the customers. And that's how it worked. At Gia Marino's insistence, Aurora always put aside 10% of its earnings to reinvest in new equipment. This allowed them to begin a line of model ships, which began with a model of the nuclear submarine Nautilus. It was a huge success and remained in their catalog until the company closed in 1977. By the end of 1953, Aurora had outgrown their little Brooklyn facility, so they moved the operation to West Hempstead in Long Island. By 1954, retailers wanted more expensive products, to which Aurora responded with a 19-inch wingspan model of the Martin B-26 Marauder medium bomber, selling for a whopping $2.59. The plastic kit industry was in growth, but was also a period of weaning out the weak. Aurora had a simple philosophy get to market first, in volume, with a quality product at a low price. But in order to do this, they often had to sacrifice accuracy. Any new airplane or ship that came out had an Aurora model of it on the shelves, probably before anybody else, even if it wasn't completely accurate. The molds and designs were often based on nothing more than some photographs that were available. Say what you like, Aurora was becoming a top-selling model company. One of the ways Aurora kept the price down was by using a standard size box, which resulted in a wild variety of scales, but it kept the prices down, ergo, the models sold. In 1955, Aurora decided to try their hand at 
crafts that girls would enjoy and came up with a copper etching set. It did okay, but was not the bonanza they'd hoped for, so they dropped it after a few years until store owners said they wanted it back. Never a great seller, but it stayed in production off and on. They tried a few other crafts products that failed, so they focused on models. One reason that Aurora kits had less detail than their competitors was that the patterns from which the molds were made were cut to one-to-one -one scale. Most companies made the pattern at a double scale or larger and then used a panograph machine to cut the mold at a reduced scale. By doing it this way, Aurora limited the detail, but they felt that it wasn't critical in the 1950s. In the 1960s, that would not be quite so true. In 1956, Aurora issued some of the first plastic kit model tanks and other tracked vehicles complete with vinyl tracks. Some feel these were the best kits they had produced to date. They also tried something new by introducing a figurine, the Silver Knight. This was their first foray into what would become a very large part of their business, kit figurines. In 1957, Aurora even introduced a line of small scale kits that sold for only 29 cents. They're the cheapest kits to ever be made and marketed. They also ventured into model trucks, but they were a disappointment. There was some good news with the new figurines market, beginning with an additional series of knights as well as introducing the guys and gals of all nations line of figurines. In the late 1950s, the industry was starting to shake out some of the weaker operators and Aurora acquired the molds of some of these companies. In 1959, they tried model cars again with molds they had acquired from closing companies. These enjoyed better success, which was good because by 1960, the figurines were no longer selling well. Aurora had also diversified into toys by this point, largely by buying out other companies. By the early 60s, Aurora bought out molds from seven different companies, including Strombecker's TT-1 and Cessna T-37 molds. Part of Aurora's success was their frugality, and I mean to the point that Abe Shikes would yell if he found the lights left on in an empty room. In fact, now might be a good time to get into the personalities of some of the three men who ran Aurora. The company president from 1952, Abe Shikes, was born in Russia during the days of the Tsar but he left for America after the Bolshevik Revolution. He spoke fluent Russian, and at five foot four, his gregarious and energetic manner made him seem taller. He was a World War II veteran who'd been in the Battle of the Bulge, and although great at getting things done, he was, by all accounts I could find, an unapologetic self-promoter. He was a major stockholder in Aurora and a silent partner at first, but became president when John Cuomo came on. He was a hard-driving businessman who drove hard bargains with vendors and suppliers. In a nutshell, he was a force to be reckoned with. Initially, the president of Aurora was Joe Giamarino, a soft-spoken man who was known as Mr. Aurora. He primarily handled day-to-day -day operations and the company's technical issues. He insisted that the models had a good fit. In 1952, he took over operations full-time to keep the company running and handed the presidency over to Abe Shikes. Last was John Cuomo, who came on in 1952. When he came on board, he got 10% of the stock, and Shikes and Gia Marino split the rest. Primarily a salesman, he was very well liked, and by all accounts, was an affable personality. This is probably one reason he was so good at sales and promotion. Although these three different personalities complemented each other in the success of the company, it also led to simmering tensions, and as we shall see, Eventually, that had an adverse effect in the end. In 1962, something happened that was to have a bigger impact on the company than anyone could have predicted. It sent Aurora on an entirely new trajectory. They made their first movie monsters, and it almost never happened. At the Hobby Industry Annual Convention, they showed their first monster kit, Frankenstein. They were almost laughed out of the place. But on the last day, the members could bring their families. In what could only be described as a generation gap in marketing, the attendees' kids absolutely flipped over the Frankenstein model. The calculus was rather simple. These 30-year-old properties were frequently recycled on weekend television, and the parents had no idea how popular they were with their kids. 
This kicked off the entire line of monsters and character kits. It was ironic that the previous figurines had flounder because Aurora had made kits of things that parents would like, but not what the kids would like. Lesson learned. The list of products that Aurora produced in the 1960s is staggering. They had acquired some molds from other companies that were simply not up to the increasing quality standards of their competitors, so they just kept them cheap. At the same time, they made new molds that were actually quite good. They did everything, and I mean everything. Ships, planes, cars, tanks, cannons, trucks, characters, monsters. And this was an addition of toys, games, and especially the new slot car racing. Aurora would get into slot car racing in an enormous way. Some flopped, some soared, and some just puttered along like the model of the USS Nautilus. Aurora had always been interested in going international and had done so as soon as they could. Aurora Canada opened in 1964 and through the company Matoy they had developed a distribution network in Britain. By making models in Canada they could import to Britain and the Commonwealth nations without import taxes. Eventually, Aurora set up manufacturing in Great Britain. They had also moved into a much new larger facility off the Hempstead Turnpike. Everything was coming up Aurora. In 1966, Aurora hit a real milestone when it was listed on the New York Stock Exchange in the banner AUR. There was so much going on at Aurora in the 1960s that it really did take a book to lay it all out. The 1960s were truly the golden era of plastic kit modeling. It was a growing industry, until it wasn't. In 1967, Aurora had 284 kits in its catalogs, more than any other kit maker. But then the bottom fell out of the slot car market almost as fast as it had started. In fact, there was a recession in the whole hobby industry, and the personality differences between the three men who ran the company bubbled to the surface. Abe Shikes wanted to move towards games based on the wild success Aurora had with the game Skittle Bowl. Gia Marino was convinced that the success was a one-time fluke. John Cuomo was tired of dealing with Abe Shikes, and so, at age 66, he packed it in and retired. In 1968, with tension still brewing, Abe Shikes got enough support from the stockholders to oust Joe Gia Marino. This flabbergasted the Aurora staff. Joe had been Mr. Aurora. But Abe Shike's victory would be a Pyrrhic one. Just a year later, in 1969, Joe Giamarino sold his stock to an investment group run by Charles Diker, a New York investor. Diker almost immediately had Shikes removed as the president. They created the position of chairman of the board for him, but a year later he retired. With the massacre complete, Diker took over and everything changed. Diker, a Harvard-trained businessman, eschewed the haphazard fly-by-the-seat-of-your-pants way the previous team had run things. He was going to structure Aurora like a modern business. Diker had been a vice president, ironically, at Revlon Cosmetics, and knew what a modern corporate structure should look like. And Aurora was not it. Diker wanted to push headlong in the toy and games business, even though he knew how ephemeral it could be. He pumped money into departments such as sales and research and development, as well as jazzing up the headquarters. But Diker needed more money and got turned down everywhere after posting a $1.5 million loss for 1970. The White Knight was Nabisco, who bought Aurora and infused badly needed cash. Here's where it gets a little weird. Aurora did sell a lot of games. In fact, only Milton Bradley sold more. Their sales skyrocketed, but they still lost money. Fiscal issues aside, Diker faced a new self-inflicted wound. In 1971, in order to separate Aurora from other model makers, they went back to their monster characters, but added some new flourishes such as torture devices. Long story short, it caused an outrage with parents. Nabisco wanted nothing to do with it. These were the same parents who bought their staple food products. The product line was dropped and any remaining inventory was sent to Canada. Aurora plotted along with various ways to keep modelers' interest. Funny cars, nice World War I aircraft, superheroes. Some of these kits had large sales volumes, but the 1973-74 Arab fuel embargo had hit the plastic industries hard. By 1975, things had stabilized, 
But Aurora got another knock on the head. Lee Bickmore, the president of Nabisco who had okayed the purchase of Aurora, fell ill and had to retire. His replacement was not nearly as supportive to Dyke's policy of losing money up front to get a large foothold in the market. He cut back on Aurora's financial support, prompting Dykes to leave. Dykes' replacement was Boyd Brown, and to his credit, he tried to make Aurora work, but problems were rife. Many of the old timers were gone and much of the staff were just punching the clock. Many of the molds were in bad shape. Brown worked hard to get the operation working smoothly and they put out some good kits, but market forces were just not in their favor. Essentially, young people were finding new ways to spend their time and money. In 1977, Nabisco decided the best way to unload Aurora was to part it out. Monogram models bought Aurora's molds, essentially just to keep anyone else from getting them, but they knew that Aurora had some really good molds in their product line, so those were now added to the monogram product line. The Aurora molds kept churning out models until July of 1977, just in order to complete the order backlog that they had. After that, they were loaded on a train and sent to the monogram facilities in Illinois. There was one final indignity for the Aurora gang. The train carrying the now former Aurora molds derailed and many of the precious molds were tossed into a field. Many of them finally arrived in Illinois caked in mud. Some would see further service as monogram kits. Others were tossed. Although Aurora ceased to exist, many of its kits continued in one form or another not only as monogram kits, but also as ADAR, which was started by Abe Shikes, in part with old Aurora molds that he'd leased. There was also Polar Lights, Mobius, Atlantis, Monarch, and now Round 2. Vintage Aurora kit collecting has become a subculture in its own right. John Cuomo passed away in 1971. Abe Shikes, who'd never been sick a day in his life, passed from cancer in 1982 and Joe Giamarino passed away in 1992. With the passing of Mr. Aurora, the company was truly gone. Well, as long as we still build them, they're not really completely gone. Ravel, the California Kid. Ravel was based in Venice, California. Started by Lou Glazer shortly before the attack on Pearl Harbor, it was originally called Precision Specialties. And like Aurora, started out making plastic items on contract for other vendors. But unlike Aurora, it grew during World War II. Ironically, it was largely cosmetic cases that made up a fair chunk of their work. The customer? Revlon Cosmetics. Lou Glazer wanted to make the cosmetic cases under a new name. In a case of what today we would call crowdsourcing, he held a naming contest. Ravel was the winning entry because it had a similar sound to Revlon, but it was actually inspired by the French word Rivière, which means to awaken. So Precision Specialties made the Revlon cases under the Ravel name. After the war in 1946, Glazer took a shot at the toy market and it was a rough four years for Precision Specialties. They almost tanked, despite repeated attempts to launch new plastic toy lines. They finally got traction in 1950 with a 1/16th scale pull toy model of a 1911 Maxwell automobile. This outdated car was made famous as the car Jack Benny used in his comedy routines. The car was a hit and Precision Specialties followed up with other cars in a series called Highway Pioneers. The series was a hit and unlike most offerings in the fickle toy market, demand stayed high year round, not just at holidays. So, more toys were introduced. Precision Specialties was now on its way in the toy business. In 1950, Lou married his wife, Royal. A student at Berkeley who initially hailed from the American Midwest, she would become an important figure in Ravel's future. In 1952, Lou decided to get Precision Specialties into the new plastic kit model business with a detailed model of the USS Missouri Battleship. This was no small undertaking and he was betting the company on it. As part of this new direction, he completely renamed Precision Specialties Ravel. The Missouri model was a huge smash, and following its success, Ravel released a line of somewhat lower quality kit model jets. Like Aurora, 
Lou had an eye for what was new. And so he made what could be called a scientific wild ass guess at what the Navy's newest submarine, the nuclear powered Nautilus, looked like. Aurora and Lindbergh were also making kits of the famous sub that were actually much more accurate than the Revell offering. But the Revell kit sold regardless. About this time, Tony Ballone, the artist who made the model for the Missouri molds, showed some small detailed figurines he had carved, and it was obvious that such figures could add life to the somewhat rudimentary models of the time. And this began a trend that is now a staple of kit models. This also led to the 1953 introduction of Ravel's Masterpiece Miniature Series. Lou was afraid that the big companies like Mattel might get into the kit model business and crush a small operation like Ravel. So he focused on expanding the line as quickly as possible. This meant taking on debt. By 1954, Ravel was producing an expanding catalog of kits with beautiful artwork provided largely by Scotty Edison and later Hungarian-born Richard Kishady. Ironically, Kishady had been a Hungarian combat pilot who flew Stukas and Falkovov 190s against the Russians before immigrating to America. Throughout the 1950s, Ravel grew and sales soared. The factory was enlarged and morale was high. Lou Glazer treated his employees very well and was in fact paying above the industry standard wages. He ate lunch in the company cafeteria and talked with his employees. Like the folks at Aurora, he kept in close touch with the workers. And this makes a good segue into the person that Lou Glazer was. Originally from New York, Lou and his family moved to California when he was a kid. Hardworking and curious by nature, he was well liked by everyone, but he was also a workaholic, much to the occasional irritation of his wife, Royal. She said he would sometimes fall asleep at dinner and then work right through the night. His dedication to Ravel was without question. In 1958, Glazer formed Ravel of Great Britain and later Ravel of Germany. In 1959, they marketed their kits in Japan, although they would bounce around between numerous vendors. By the early 1960s, about 20% of Ravel's profits were coming from overseas sales. In 1967, Ravel, which already had a prodigious product line, introduced what many modelers feel is the best kit series of modeling's golden era, the 132nd scale World War II combat aircraft series. The first of these kits with their outstanding artwork by Jack Glenwood was the P-40E. It was followed by the BF-109F and the Spitfire Mark I. Many modelers feel that the P-40 was nearly perfect. The line later added a JU-87B Stuka, a P-47D Thunderbolt, a P-51B Mustang, an F-4F-4 Wildcat, an A6M50, and a UH-1D Huey and AH-1G Cobra helicopters, and later even a Hawker Hurricane. These kits are still popular today, sometimes commanding over $50. The series was so popular that more kits were added to the line up to the mid-1970s, including a Corsair and a Phantom Jet, amongst others. The end of the 1960s brought new problems to Ravel, the chief of which was Lou Glazer's cancer diagnosis. He underwent treatments and continued to work into the early 1970s, but the new decade had more obstacles for Ravel. One issue that began to crop up, probably in no small part of the Vietnam War, was why so many products were military in nature. Lou Glazer simply and honestly answered that those were the kits that sold. Ravel had an enormous number of non-military subjects, but combat aircraft and vehicles still made up a good portion of their product line. In order to stay in business, they had to follow the popular trends or risk going under. Ravel had always been in a financially precarious situation. They had a wide and varied product line and international presence, but that required great expenditures. This was the risk that had to be taken in order to be a major player in the industry. By early 1972, Lou's illness forced him to work from home. He put his beloved and very competent wife, Royal, in charge. On September 12, 1972, Lou lost his battle to cancer. Both Lou and Ravel's board of directors had spent some time grooming Royal to take over the company. Despite the loss of such a well-liked and respected leader, Ravel continued on. 
Royal brought a certain pragmatism to Revell that helped them stabilize and stay financially in the black. She did not have Lou's desire to be the biggest model company at all costs. She trimmed dead weight, consolidated the business, and got them back on a solid financial footing. In 1975, Revell purchased Renwall's tooling. Royal explained that it was a cost-effective way to extend Revell's product line at a low cost. Revell's R&D and marketing teams found ways to keep Revell relevant. Everything from movie tie-ins to sponsorships of drag racers and models of wacky cartoon vehicles. Some of the purists in the design department were not too thrilled about some of the whimsical models, but they were a success. In 1976, America's bicentennial year, a model of the Goodyear blimp was made, and it was a huge success, if even only for that one year. Around this time, the space shuttle was entering the American lexicon, and Ravel wasted no time in making a model with working bay doors. Ravel stayed nimble. As the sales of dragsters sagged, Ravel began producing a line of tractor trailers and semi-truck models to cash in on this CB radio and trucker craze. They even made a deal with Billy Carter, President Jimmy Carter's colorful brother, to make a model of his truck, or more accurately, a truck that Ravel had made and gifted to him. In fact, despite all the challenges of the 1970s, 1976 turned out to be Ravel's pinnacle year with earnings of $34 million. But rising operating costs were eating into the profits. Things were okay for now, but they could see the storm on the horizon and nobody was kidding themselves. Unlike their chief competitor, Monogram, Ravel had a high cost operation and something had to change in order for the company to survive. Ravel had to break the $3 price barrier for kit models, which was considered industry changing. Royal kept fighting, but everywhere she looked, Barbie dragons. Enough was enough, and it was time to merge the company or sell it. In 1979, Ravel was sold to a French operation, Compagnie Générale des Jouets, and a French transition team started moving in. The French promptly outsourced much of the work and let many of the employees go. Some got jobs with the new company, but many did not. It was the beginning of the 80s and a new way of doing business had arrived in Venice. Royal was given a seat on the board, but in 1982 she left Ravel, closing the door on a 41-year long leadership cadre at Ravel. Four years later, in 1986, the French company decided that Ravel was not meeting their expectations and it was sold to the Odyssey Group. The Odyssey Group had recently acquired monogram models and after 45 years of head-to-head -head competition, the two companies were merged in Ravel Monogram. The operation in Venice was closed and everything was moved to Monogram's facilities in Illinois. The old Ravel was gone, but the name and the kit survived. Now, this is where the two stories of Ravel and Monogram become one, so I'll stop here and pick back up after I tell the Monogram story. Monogram Models was founded by Jack Besser, and Robert Reeder in 1945. Both men had worked at Comet Models before World War II, but upon their return to Chicago, they founded their own company. They initially began out of a basement of Reeder's mother's house. They quickly found a place to set up a more permanent operation and began making wooden model kit ships that were easy to assemble and had a good look. In 1946, they introduced a flying model called the Whirlwind, a flying model that did not really resemble any particular airplane, but it was easy to build and it flew well. In 1949, Speedy built kits were introduced. These were flying models of real planes that came with many pre-shaped parts. This made them easy to build, and as a result, they were popular kits. But as the line expanded, the heavier pre-made parts, often made of solid balsa, made them hard to fly. Sometimes they didn't really fly at all. But the kids liked the looks, especially of the warbirds. In 1951, super kits were introduced. These were non-flying scale models for display purposes. They were made of wood, but the woodworking machines of the era could not really cut the fine details. Super kits sold, but not as well as hoped and the line only lasted about four years. Monogram had moved to a bigger facility, but the conservative management of Jack Besser and Robert Reeder meant that it also ran a tight ship. So, despite this expense, Monogram was on a solid financial footing, 
a situation that would become characteristic of Monogram under the leadership of Reeder and Besser. Monogram's conservatism meant that they were a bit slow getting into plastics. Even though Hawk Models had introduced plastic kits as early as 1946, many modelers thought plastics were a flash in the pan. Then in 1951, Ravel started making plastic kits. In 1952, both Aurora and in Europe, Airfix were starting to make plastic model kits. Even to old school wooden model builders like Besser and Reeder, it looked like they needed to give plastic some serious thought. This is where the old school and the new school collided. Old school modelers believed in craftsmanship, woodworking, and artisan practices. Besser and Reeder did not want to see those skills lost, but they also knew that this was a business, so they hit upon a compromise. In 1953 to 54, plastic detail parts that could not be cut on industrial wood lathes were added to the kits. This served three purposes. It gave the models a nicer look, they were easier to build, and it preserved some of the woodcrafting skills. And as a bonus, it helped draw the attention of kids. It did help sales. But Monogram was slow to move entirely to plastics. This conservative approach may have limited their market saturation, but it also limited their exposure. Setting up for plastics was a hugely expensive endeavor. Mold making was expensive and time consuming. Most companies took about a year from the time they committed to building a plastic kit model until it was actually on the store shelves. After starting in all plastics with model cars and boats, Monogram released six all plastic model airplane kits. They also included very nice store displays. The models were packaged in uniform sized boxes that had store shelves in mind. They were also cleverly marketed as gift packs. As plastic models grew in popularity, so did Monogram's product line. Robert Reeder ran the shop. Despite his quiet and reserved demeanor, he was a stickler for detail and accuracy. Jack Besser ran the business end of things with an incredible energy. Always a physical fitness buff, Besser had a great deal of drive and stamina. Andy traits when growing such a labor-intensive business. The two men made for a well-oiled operation. When combined with their conservative approach, this made Monogram a very successful company. In 1957, like the other companies, they started a line of military and armored vehicles, but they did something that confuses people to this day. They made some of the models in two near but different scales, 132nd scale and 135th scale. There was no standard back then and Monogram just wanted to make kits that would fit into a standard box. Little did they know that this would drive some modelers nuts. The kits were not big hits, and although they stayed in production, no more military vehicles would be added until the 1960s. In 1958, they started a line of rockets and missiles. They even teamed up with famous German rocket scientist Willy Ley on a series of possible future spacecraft. These vehicles were all over the news at the time, and at first sales were brisk. But as these systems would fall out of the news or retired early by the military due to superior technologies, kit sales likewise fell off and the series floundered. At the same time, other kits were enjoying great success as they got back into model cars. By 1959, building models was listed as the number one boys hobby with four out of five boys in America engaged in it. 10 years earlier, it didn't even make the list. Aurora and Ravel were beating each other up as they vied for the position of top dog, with the 1959 Aurora catalog showing 152 kits for sale versus Ravel's 118. Monogram stayed out of the fray by focusing on quality, not quantity. Monogram's 1959 catalog only showed 64 kits and almost a third of them still had wooden components. As with all the model companies, the 1960s brought change. In 1961, Monogram, having outgrown its current facility, moved operations to Morton Grove, Illinois. Having always kept a close relationship with their now 350 employees and not wanting to lose these experienced workers, Besser and Reeder decided to offer a bus service to the Chicago suburb to ease the transportation issues that the move might have brought about for employees. They did not really expect it to be very popular, but in fact it was and continued for several years. This is also when Monogram put out one of its most iconic kits, the 132nd scale Phantom Mustang. For such a conservative company, it was clear 
pardon the pun, that Monogram did not hurt for imagination. This is because they'd hired a lot of very clever people to work in their research and development department. More and more kits were added to their line, and deals were struck with exotic car designers like Daryl Starbird and his futuristic Predicta automobile. As a response to Hawk's popular line of weirdos, which were essentially plastic models of cartoon cars, the serious, straight-laced team at Monogram released its own set of model cartoon cars in 1964, and to great success. Monogram may have had a reputation as the choice for the serious modeler, but uh, business is business. Monogram's ever-growing line of quality products and conservative management could not save it from a changing market. Sales were still good, but Monogram's management team was very aware that larger and better funded model companies were on the scene now and that the marketplace was only going to get tougher. For example, from Japan, the Tamiya company had a well-established reputation for quality that raised the bar. Everyone knew, especially Jack Besser, that if Monogram was to survive in the long term, it needed more resources. That meant a merger, preferably to a powerhouse company. In 1968, Besser reached out to potential suitors, and to their surprise, Mattel Toys entered the picture. Mattel was the largest toy company in the world and wanted to diversify into other areas. The problem was that kit models are not toys. They're hobbies, they're crafts. It's a different market, a very different market. Mattel's owners, Ruth and Elliot Handler, promised to keep all of Monogram's people in their current position and the deal was done in October of 1968. Payment was made in the form of Mattel stock. When the announcement was made to Monogram's employees, there was a sense of dread about what was coming, despite being insured by Besser and Reeder that this would guarantee Monogram's future. The very next year, 1969, Mattel let the entire Monogram sales staff go, despite their promises to keep all of Monogram's employees. They handed the sales off to the Mattel sales department, but they lacked experience in selling models, which was a very different market than selling toys. Although Monogram still had a great deal of autonomy, Besser and Reader had to go to California every month for meetings with the Mattel senior management. Every major decision required Mattel's approval. One thing they did agree on was when they recommended to Mattel to make a toy-like model of Snoopy's airplane. Mattel saw it had play value and being a toy company, they liked it, and it was a huge seller in 1970. But development on serious scale models ground to a near halt. The real problem came later, as Mattel insisted on play value for models, which led to some real duds, probably the worst of which was the Sky Stick's ridiculous control stick that you could place a model on and manipulate with a joystick. It really served no function. I would love to have been at that meeting, I'm pretty sure Reader and Besser were about to pull their hair out. Well, Besser didn't have any, but you get my point. The monthly trips for California meetings with Mattel were wearing on Besser and Reader both, and Ruth Handler wasn't terribly thrilled with Besser's constant pushback. He was not used to answering to higher-ups, and she was not used to having her orders questioned, but they made it work. In fact, in 1973, Ruth Handler admitted that firing the Monogram sales staff was a mistake and asked Besser and Reeder if they would like to take back control of the marketing. Now, they jumped on the chance. Unfortunately, Mattel had some underlying problems that Monogram did not know about, and they were going to spill over into Monogram in a big way. To make a complex story very short, Mattel had suffered some decline in sales, particularly of its Hot Wheels brand, during 1970-71, and instead of admitting their losses, they basically cooked the books, covered it up. The Security and Exchange Commission caught wind of it, and the fallout was the handlers were forced to step down. A new CEO took over at Mattel, and friction with Jack Besser began not long after. In 1975, the Mattel CEO went to the Monogram factory in Illinois and unceremoniously fired Besser. One of the two founding partners that started Monogram was out of his office that evening. Besser was replaced by Tom Gannon, who ran the business without sentiment, but wisely left Robert Reeder in charge of running things at the factory. Gannon oversaw such new ways of doing business as having molds made in China and updating the plastics pellet processes and a lot of other things. Production was increased and mass marketing was introduced. 
Gannon was a no-nonsense businessman who could be hard to work with, but he was very effective. He was also willing to tolerate pushback if something good was to come of it. Monogram continued to put out new kits and business grew. In 1977, they were able to acquire the now defunct Aurora molds. Despite the train derailment that tossed molds into a muddy field, many former Aurora kits were put into production under the Monogram name, eventually even the popular Frankenstein figure. Monogram continued to come out with new kits and were making models in every category. At the end of 1983, Tom Gannon retired as president of Monogram, and shortly thereafter, Mattel announced it wanted to sell Monogram off. Gannon was able to get investors and bought out Monogram in 1984. Only two years later, the new investors decided to sell it again. In 1986, Odyssey Partners bought Monogram, and it already had an option to buy Ravel models. Whereas Monogram was consistently profitable, Ravel was not but Ravel had the larger product line and overseas presence. And now, for the conclusion of the Ravel Monogram story. Although Monogram was the buyer, ergo the dominant company, the decision was made to keep Ravel's name on top, partly for tax reasons and partly due to their larger market presence and brand recognition. Despite this, the Ravel plant in Venice was closed, the people let go, and the molds moved to Monogram's plant in Illinois. As I mentioned earlier, Tom Gannon retired shortly after the merger. The models were still produced and marketed under separate names until 1997, when they were fully combined into the Ravel Monogram logo, with the exception of the Monogram Pro Modeler series. After this, there were a litany of owners. In 1994, it was sold to Hallmark. In 2001, Alpha International. A year later, Gearbox Toys. Then to the new Ravel. And in 2007, to Hobby Co. Unfortunately, in 2018, Hobby Co. itself went bankrupt and went into liquidation. This ended, at least for now, the Ravel Monogram line, with the exception of Ravel Germany, which is still operating. Someone may yet acquire the molds and put them back into production, but whether the Monogram name is permanently gone from store shelves or not, they existed for over 70 years and gave four generations of model builders a reason to open a tube of glue and start building. The early entrepreneurs have all passed away now, but my respect for them has not. Their hard work, attention to detail, commitment to the hobby, not to mention their willingness to assume the risk of starting a new venture, their business skills and vision allowed them to flourish and guide an industry to maturity. Despite the eventual fates of each company, what these people did during their influential years in the industry still resonates with us today. From the captivating artwork that covered the box tops and stimulated our young imaginations to the sense of accomplishment at a completed model. These pioneers, amongst others, helped spark the imaginations and creative spirits of an entire generation of kids. And for that, we should always be grateful.
Baby, 